Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem longest subarray with maximum bitwise and. So immediately from just looking at the problem, we're finding the longest subarray. So how many subarrays are in an array, generally n squared. So at the very least, just from looking at the problem, the brute force is gonna be n squared. So automatically, before I even know exactly what the question is asking for, I'm thinking in my head, how can we improve this? How can we get it down to possibly and log in time. Perhaps we can get it down to linear time. There are several algorithms I know that run in linear time on an array. Algorithms such as uh, the prefix sums thing that we were actually covering yesterday, sliding window algorithm, two pointers algorithm, and in my head, there's actually another algorithm that's heavily related to these two, Cadane's algorithm. It also has to deal with subarrays the same way that two pointers and sliding window do. And quite frankly, this is practically Cadane's problem. The only difference is that instead of finding the longest subarray sum, the maximum subarray sum, the longest subarray, with the maximum sum, we are looking for the longest subarray with the maximum bitwise and. Actually, I guess technically Cadane's algorithm, the maximum subarray problem, it doesn't look for the longest subarray. But in any case, let me read the problem so this makes more sense anyway. The idea is that we're given a array. And in that array, we want to find the maximum possible bitwise and that we can create. Not the maximum sum that we do in the traditional Cadane's algorithm, but the maximum bitwise and. So in Cadane's algorithm, we find the pattern of finding sums. We find that if there's a negative sum, we can remove it. We can not consider it. So perhaps there's also a pattern when it comes to bitwise and. So now let's get into the problem. And quickly before I do, I just want to mention that all of these like patterns and these kinds of things, if you're new to them, if you don't know what these words mean, I do cover them in my advanced algorithms course. I'm not saying like you have to buy it or whatever, but thought it was worth mentioning. So we're given this input array. There's several subarrays that we could look at. We only care about the subarrays that have the maximum possible and bitwise and that is. So in this example, the maximum possible bitwise and is actually three. So this would be one example of a subarray. This would be a second example. And this would be the third example. Among all of those subarrays with a bitwise and of three, which is the maximum bitwise and that we can achieve, we want the length of the longest subarray. I just showed you there's only three of them. This is the longest one. The length of it is two. Therefore, the return value is two. OK, now how do we figure it out algorithmically? There is the n squared solution, but is there an optimization that we can make? It's actually simpler than you think. So instead of giving you a really long explanation, I'll give you a short one. Consider this. We start with one. This is what it looks like in binary representation. Take the second number, it's two. This is what it looks like in binary representation. Bitwise anding them is taking the bits. And if they're both one, the output is one. If they're not both one, the output is zero. They're not both one here as well, so the output is zero here. So now we just realized this, we were here. This was our subarray. This was the maximum bitwise and we could achieve one so far. And then we got to two. So now we're trying to find the longest subarray. So ideally, bitwise anding these together will give us the maximum bitwise and that we've seen so far, but it gives us zero instead. So what do we do? Well, we kind of have to start over. I mean, this guy, we want a continuous subarray, so we can't really extend this anymore. So we should then just stop that. So kind of like Cadane's algorithm, just kind of ignore the stuff that came before and now restart from here. And by the way, what is the bitwise and of a single number? Well, it's two. So now actually this was greater than our original maximum. So, so far the maximum bitwise and we can achieve is two. I could continue this sort of simulation, but this problem is actually simpler than that when you break it down. Let's now deeply consider what's going on with bitwise and. Consider an arbitrary binary number something that looks like this. And suppose that this is our current bitwise and. We are trying to maximize the bitwise and. There are three scenarios. One is that we come across a number that is less than our current number. In that case, it could be anything, like it could be like this. It's only one smaller, like you took the one bit and turned it into a zero. It could be smaller in any sort of way. But the point is that if you take a smaller number and bitwise and it with a number, the result 
is always going to be smaller than what we originally had. So in this case, we'd only get a one set here and a one set here. It could have also been possible that this number had some one set in positions where uh, this one didn't. And in that case, we'd actually just end up with a big fat zero. Well, I guess they're the same here, but you get the point. If you take a bigger number, bitwise and it with a smaller number, the result will always be smaller than the bigger number. What that means is whatever our current bitwise and is so far, if we come across a number that is smaller than our current bitwise and, at that point, we cannot further extend our window. We wanted to extend it. We wanted to add this guy, but no, we can't. It's just going to make our results smaller. We only care about the maximum bitwise and. So therefore, now the size of our subarray is back to zero. Not even back to one, it's back to zero because this is not a valid subarray. So that's case one. The new number is smaller. Case two and three are going to be where the number is equal and where the number is greater. Let's start where the number is equal. So when you have two equal numbers, the bitwise and of both of them is always going to be the same. So if you take x, bitwise and it with x, the result is always going to be x. So, okay, so if we had a subarray with the maximum bitwise and so far that we've seen, and now we come across a number that is the same as our current bitwise and, well, now we can extend it. So now to our window, we'd say size plus one. That's great. The third case is a bit more interesting. You come across a number that is actually greater than the current bitwise and. It could look something like this, where you know some of the bits are different, some of the bits are the same, but the most significant bit here, the most significant different bit is a one in the second number, or you might even have something that looks like this. It doesn't really matter. The whole point is that this number is bigger than this one, and therefore the bitwise and of these two is always gonna be smaller than this second number. Why is that? For the exact same reason I told you. Remember, this is the exact same as case one. The only difference is that in case one, we had the bigger number on top and the smaller number on the bottom. Remember, when you take a big number, bitwise and it with a smaller one, it's always going to be smaller than the bigger number. So once again, the result will be a smaller number. But the thing is, what do we do in this case? This was our current subarray, suppose, with a certain bitwise and. Well, I guess to put it in more concrete terms, this was our current subarray with a two. Now we came across a three. Three is bigger than two. If we bitwise and these, it's gonna be smaller than three. I think specifically the bitwise and of both of those would actually end up being two. Not that that matters. We already know it's smaller than three. So far, the maximum bitwise and that we can see is actually three. So what we wanna do is now we were trying to extend our subarray. We can't do it. We reset it not to zero this time. We actually set it to one because this is bigger than the max that we've seen so far. So now that we realize all of this, we realize these patterns, it has to do with the bigger numbers. Now take a look at this example one more time closely. The only time, if you were to go back and rewind those three cases, the only time we actually extend our subarray is when two adjacent values are equal. And since we're trying to maximize the bitwise and, we found that we're only looking for the maximum values. So therefore, this problem is just a more complicated way of wording the problem. Find the longest consecutive subarray with the maximum element within the array. So all of a sudden, this problem is actually very easy and very approachable for us. So how would I solve it? There's actually two approaches. So I'll show you two different ways to code this up. One is actually really easy. You'd first just take the maximum of this array. Just find the maximum. You can do that with a built-in function or however you want to do it. The max is three in this case. So we would look for the longest subarray with all threes. So we'd look at the first element. It's not a three. We don't care about it. It's a two. We don't care about it. It's a three. Okay. Size of our window right now is one. Second value, three. Add one to the size of our window. So far, the max window we have is two. Now it's two over here. That's not three. Reset the size of our window back to zero, but the current maximum that we computed, our result is still two. We want to maintain that. So now we see a two, skip it. Don't really care about the size. This example is pretty simple, but imagine that after that, I'm going to kind of continue uh, this array down here. Suppose after all of those values, we actually saw a few more threes and then another three and then another three. So how would you code it? Well, now that I've seen a three, my current size 
is zero, I'm gonna increment my size. Now my size is gonna be equal to one. Now I see a second three, I'm gonna set it to plus one. Now I see a third three, I'm gonna add plus one again, and now it's finally bigger than the result. The result will now be set to three. Now if I saw another three, I would do the same thing. If I saw a number that's not three, for example two, then size would be reset back to zero. So let's code up this approach first. Technically it's a two pass approach because we are recomputing the maximum. There's another way to code it up. I'll show you after that. So I'm gonna get what I call the target. This is just the maximum. I'm gonna take max of nums. The reason I'm not calling it max is because that is a built-in function in Python. I'm gonna maintain two variables, the size and the result, as I just kind of showed. And I'm gonna go through every number in the input array nums. And if n is equal to the target, just increment the size by one. Otherwise, reset the size back to zero. After each of those, we want to potentially maximize the result. So do it just like that. And then at the end down here, we're gonna return the result. Um, let me make sure I type it correctly. This is the entire code, a bit easier than you were expecting, isn't it? But don't forget that we kind of changed the problem. The problem was asking for bitwise and, but we're not looking for that anymore. So let me run it. As you can see, it's efficient. In terms of big O time complexity, this is linear. We don't have any data structure, so it's constant space, but technically this is a two pass solution. We did pre-compute the maximum. There is another way to code it up. I'll actually do that now. It doesn't really require anything special. Just remember the three cases. I'll summarize them for you here. So I'm actually gonna write out the variables first. So we are still gonna have the size and the result. Initially, they're both gonna be set to zero. We're gonna have an extra variable this time called the current max. I'm gonna set it to zero. And we're gonna iterate over the nums like this for n and nums. At the end, we're gonna go ahead and return the result. So what's gonna go in between here is gonna be determined by these three comments that I have up above. Remember that if the current number, n is the current number, is less less than our current max, then the bitwise and of those together is guaranteed to be less than the current max. Remember that if they're equal, then the bitwise and of them is also going to be equal. It's going to stay the same. But if n is greater than the current max, it's the same as case one. Bitwise anding them together is only going to make the result smaller. But we are going to handle these two cases slightly differently. I think it'll just make more sense if I code it up. I'm actually going to start with this one up here. If n is greater than our current max, what should we do? Well, our current max is going to be n. Remember, we're looking for the longest consecutive subarray with the maximum element. n is our current maximum element. So we're gonna set current max equal to n. We're gonna reset the size down to one, and we're gonna actually reset the result as well. It'll make more sense when I code up the rest of it, but we might have been updating the result. So right now I'm gonna reset the result down to zero. The other case is if they're equal, well, that's when we're actually increasing the size of our window. So else if n is equal to current max, just increment the size by one. Lastly, if n is smaller than our current max, then reset the size of the window down to zero. And so the fact that we don't know what the actual global max of the array is means that we are gonna have to update the max periodically like this. So the result is gonna be set to the max of what it currently is and the size. At some point, we might have saw a streak of twos. Like we might have had an array that looks like this. Four consecutive twos. At that point, our result would have actually been set to four. The longest subarray with the max value is four. But eventually we'll see three. Three is bigger than two. That's when this guy's gonna evaluate and it's gonna say, reset the size back to one. Our current window is one. Not only that, but reset the result. So it's pretty rare that we write code like this. So I did wanna go through it. Reset the result down to zero and this would still execute, so the result would be set to one in this case, and then we'd um, execute this one when we get to the second three, because we see two consecutive threes in a row, so then size would be two, and then the result would end up being two, and then that's what we would end up returning. This is the entire code. You can use like these as the intuition, but these are mainly to prove to you that we're only looking for the max element, and we wanna know how many consecutive times it appears, the maximum number of consecutive times it appears. I'll run this now. Well, whoops, actually I shouldn't have done that. This is not a comment. Let me get rid of that and then rerun it. And as you can see on the left, it works. Technically this one is the same in terms of big O time and space complexity, but it is a one pass solution. So that's like the main benefit, but I kind of prefer the first solution to be honest. 